Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been really amazing watching the Abolish Eaton campaign unfold over the last few months, um, and this panel is going to cover all sorts of different elements of the campaign. Uh, the first thing to probably mention is that I'm not Ellie Sharp. I'm Chloe Tomlinson. I'm a primary school teacher and the uh, founder of the Transform Ed podcast. Um, Ellie will be joining us. Uh, she's just running a little bit late, so I'm going to get us started, and she will take over for the questions and answers. Um, we've got a really brilliant panel here today. Holly Rigby um, founded the Abolish Eaton campaign uh, and is also a teacher and a member of the London Young Teachers and National Education Union Network. Um, Aidan Dikadem is a councillor for Labour. Um, he's had some interactions with the ISC, which is the independent school campaign, um, and is a member of the Councillors uh, Against Private Schools Network. We also have Robert Fur Cake, uh, who is the author of the book Posh Boys, How the Private Schools Ruined Britain, and Thelma Walker, an ex-head teacher and teacher for 34 years, um, in, which I'm very impressed by. Uh, she's the MP for Colm Valley, and she's on the Education Select Committee. Um, before we start hearing from our panellists, I just want to give you... Oh, of course, sorry. Should also say that Tari Kali, unfortunately, has dropped out at the last minute and won't be able to make it. Um, before we hear from our panellists, um, I would just like to ask you to do something very quickly. Um, I'm going to give you about a minute. Uh, and I'd just like you to turn to the person next to you or somebody around you, if possible, somebody who you haven't come with, um, and just explain to them why have you come to this panel. There's loads of amazing events on today. What's brought you here to this one? Uh, so one minute, off you go. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for those of you who've now got into really long and interesting conversations um, because hopefully you can continue them later. Um, would anybody like to just really quickly in about 10 words uh, summarize why they've come here? Uh, it'd be great to hear from one or two people, but we can also just, just wave your hand if you're up for that. Yeah, brilliant. Um, the la lady there in the red t-shirt, please. <laughs> Okay, so we need education to think in our education establishments and everybody should be on the same level. Okay, so motivated by an interest in education. Brilliant. Um, yep, the, the person at the back with their hand up. Uh, the reason I come here is that I used to be a teacher in one of the most deprived areas of Western Europe, which is in Liverpool. And I don't see why that my kids in my school don't get the things that the kids in Eden get. Thank you. If anyone didn't hear that, um, the person who just spoke was a teacher in a very deprived area in Liverpool, and he doesn't understand why his children, who he works with, don't get the same opportunities that people at Eton get. A lot of us on this panel are teachers or ex-teachers, and I'm pretty sure um, a lot of teachers out there are also really interested in the, this campaign for that reason. I'm going to take final point from the person right at the back on the top floor, um, and then we will hear from our panellists. Can you speak as loudly as possible, but I will try and repeat it anyway. I'm here because um, it worries me a bit because what about Montessori schools and Styler schools and if some parents want to teach their kids at home, isn't that a private school? So, you know, how, is it a good idea or, or am I just not understanding that there's a distinction between independent schools and private feet paying schools? Okay, brilliant. So we have some reservations um, up there about particularly schools like Montessori schools and Steiner schools. Um, will this mean shutting those down too? What about homeschooling? Um, and I think it's always really good when we have a room full of people who don't completely agree with each other because uh, it generally makes for more interesting discussion. Um, so fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start off with Holly. Uh, so over to you. Um, yeah, can I just start by saying a massive thank you to Chloe, who we asked about four minutes before this session began to come and chair. And this is what a, grass a grassroots movement really looks like. Teachers just stepping up at the last minute. So please, can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. Um,
Um, I also just want to thank um, everyone here for coming today. I, I walked down from the station and saw people queuing outside. Um, and I think when me and, and Stephen Longdon and Sol Gamsu, the two other people who um, started the campaign, when we wrote the motion for Labour Party conference and came up with a hashtag, we didn't really expect that it was going to get to where we are now. And it's, and it's been kind of extraordinary um, because it seems to have captured the pop, uh, popular mood in some ways, I think, our campaign. Um, so that we've passed the motion in CLPs across the country. We have some of our brilliant delegates here who are going to be arguing on the conference floor uh, tomorrow for our motion. Uh, we've been backed by 300 Labour councillors, and Aiden is going to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, we've got even a new think tank set up to develop uh, some of the policies around this, which, which Rob is going to talk about. Uh, we've been on the front page of every national newspaper in the country, uh, quite extraordinarily. Uh, we've got the backing of more than 20 MPs from across the party, which which is massively down to Thelma and the work that she's done. Um, and of course, this week, the People's Chancellor, John McDonnell, has said that not only does he think that uh, private schools shouldn't exist, that this will become Labour Party policy. So we're feeling super excited. <laughs> So it's been a really, really, really exciting four months and we're really excited about what's going to happen over the next few days. Um, but I'm just going to talk about the reason why I think we've had this kind of level of success. Um, and I think in some ways, I think that uh, the campaign has tapped into a sense of real injustice about private schools. Um, and I think it's not only because of the, the grotesque inequality, actually, between private and state schools. Um, I mean, it is really indefensible. I've been arguing this case over the last few months and how do you defend the fact that 300% more is spent on the education for private school children than on the brilliant and talented children of the, teach the children that I teach in, in my state school in Newham. Um, but actually there's another part of it as well which I'm going to talk a little bit about um, which is that I think that for all of the advances that we've made in, in fighting for democracy and a voice for working people, you know, the people who sacrifice their lives at Peterloo and the struggles of suffragettes, you know, the election of Boris Johnson just reminds us that an elite still runs this country and I think our campaign has made that point very very clear um, and I think that um, we know that we need to challenge this right we cannot have a privately educated wealthy elite who are making the decisions in the interests of other people who they have a completely out of touch with um, you know I as I said I teach in a state school in Newham um, it's one of the most deprived boroughs in London um, and I was actually talking the other day about the fact that you know when I walk to school every morning and me and my students walk to school um, you know we are confronted by dozens of homeless people sleeping in the shopping centre in Newham if anyone knows it in London um, and not only that, but there are entire families in um, uh, sleeping in shipping containers in Newham because we've got such um, poor quality housing, um, and they've converted these shipping containers into the into housing that is completely un in inhospitable. Um, and this is, by the way, all at the same time. There's like a multi-billion pound Olympic Park sitting completely empty right next door to my school. So you know, I talk to my students about this, and they're understandably furious. Right? We 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 know that young people are more engaged than they ever have been before and my students look at this inequality um, and so how do I say to them that no matter how hard they work no matter how committed they are to changing society and changing their community in Newham they are statistically less likely to end up in one of the jobs running this country whether it's in the politics or the media or law because they did not go to a private school and actually that is fundamentally unjust because we are wasting the talents of ordinary hard-working people in this country and we've got Boris Johnson instead right? It's not even working, this system, right? And so, you know, actually, I think that, you know, this campaign is long, long, long overdue. Um, I think that we have done very well on the left in, in, in campaigning around education. We've seen fantastic campaigns um, to increase school funding. We've seen brilliant campaigns from the Anti-Academies Alliance um, against academisation by Comprehensive Future, against selection. And to be absolutely clear, we are fully for the full comprehensivization of our entire school system. Um, but 
actually, I do think that this issue of private schools has gone untouched, really, in lots of ways um, by the left for quite a long time. And I do think that is partly because I think lots of us know the effects of private schools, but have never really seen a private school up close. They're these kind of weird, leafy fiefdoms, like out in the countryside somewhere. Like, we know that Eton exists, but, like, nobody's actually ever been inside it. Um, you know, we don't really know what, 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 what it's like. It's sort of tucked away from the prying eyes of commoners like us. Um, and actually, you know, I went to, um, I went to visit Wellington College, um, a little bit of inside uh, research for the campaign, just to see what it was like. So I was at Wellington, you know, fees, £40,000 a year, double the average salary of, the, of, um, the, of ordinary people in this country. Um, and actually, what you saw at Wellington College, you know, this very elite private school, is in many ways what lots of things you'd expect. Extraordinary arts facilities, a full working theatre, lush and kind of boundless playing fields that they have. Um, but actually, what really struck me was how much the buildings and the architecture resembled Parliament and the House of Commons itself. Right. And, and, and this is a serious point because, you know, no wonder that Boris Johnson and his posh boy cronies feel so at home in Westminster and so at home in the House of Commons and working people feel so locked out of democracy and so locked out of Parliament because actually a private school education doesn't teach you to understand the world. It teaches you to be part of the class that runs it. So. We need to do something about this, right? We cannot let this continue, that ordinary people are locked out of democracy. And actually, if we do, then Boris Johnson is going to continue with this message that he wants to be the next general election, to be the people versus parliament. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Like, it is, I mean, it, it's completely ludicrous that Boris Johnson would represent himself as the man of the people. You know, this is Boris Johnson, friends of billionaires and bosses and bankers, um, you know, and they all went to the same elite private schools. They all hobnobbed together in their lovely country houses at the weekend, and actually, and they, you know, in the same social circles, and actually, they are the ones who give each other a hand up into these positions of power, whilst talented, hardworking young people like mine are, are met with slammed doors over and over and over again. Um, and so I think we need, to, we need to tackle this and we have to be really honest actually that um, we're going to have to work really hard actually in the next general election, right, to take on Boris Johnson because um, Muppet that he is, or twat as Pfizer Shaheen called him on, uh, on Politics Live the other day, um, actually, you know, Boris Johnson's message about the people versus parliament is resonating in some sections of society at the moment. It is, he, you know, as, as ludicrous as it is and actually, you know, the Tories have a lot to gain by dividing us into leave and to remain into the people versus parliament. You know, but as far as I'm concerned, that is a dead end for Labour, right? Because working class people voted to remain and working class people voted to leave. So actually, if we are going to win the next general election, I do believe that committing Labour to abolishing private schools is fundamental to redefining that we are the party of the many and not the few. That we are not divided along the lines of leave and remain. We are divided along the lines of the people who work hard in this country and the people who profit off our wealth, right? So, <laughs> so you know, I'm, I'm feeling quite hopeful. Rob said, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow at conference? Um, and, you know, I can't predict. I am feeling hopeful about our motion um, that we are taking to conference tomorrow. Um, and I hope it gets to the conference floor and I hope it gets adopted. Um, but I think we need to be really, really clear that we can't sit by and wait for the Labour Party to put out a radical manifesto and then wait for, you know, the mainstream media to give our policies a fair hearing. Because actually, you know, the frankly disgraceful behaviour by Laura Kunzberg this week, who, by the way, went to a very posh private school in Glasgow. <laughs> Go figure. Shows the media is never going to give us a fair hearing when it comes to this issue, right? So we can't just sit here and wait for that policy to be adopted. You know, our power has always come from building a mass movement from the grassroots, um, which is why after conference, and hopefully we've been successful, um, the Abolish Eating campaign is going to be organising a tour of public meetings up and down the country um, because we know that we need to win the argument in our communities that this unjust and unequal system of education cannot continue. We think we've won the argument on the left, but we now have to go to the country and win that argument with other people as well. 
Um, and the other thing that we need to do, which is a kind of call out as well, is that I do think we need to take this fight directly to the Tories, um, which is why I urge everyone in the room to uh, attend the Tory party conference in Manchester next weekend. Uh, the People's Assembly is organising a massive demonstration on the Sunday. Um, and really, 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 let's, let's show these private school posh boys what we really, really think of them next week. Um, and so, you know, whenever this general election comes, um, and I personally hope it's sooner rather than later, uh, you know, we need to make the case that far from this election being the people versus parliament, this election is going to be the people versus privilege. Let's abolish Boris, abolish Eton, get Jeremy Corbyn into number 10 and build a society for the many, not the few. Thank you. All right, so a hard thing to follow, but um, yeah, so my name's Aidan and I'm a councillor in Wandsworth, um, which is a Tory-run council in South West London. Um, and I had a rough idea about this campaign. I'd, I'd be, I sort of liked Holly's tweets. I saw she was like lighting fires again. Um, and I thought, yeah, go for it, go for it. And then I got an email from, uh, from something called the ISC. I'd never heard of them before. It said, dear councillor Decadem, you may be aware of a campaign advocating the abolition of independent schools. We want to make you aware of the potential consequences of this campaign. And I thought, oh, great, you know, like changes in social inequality, you know, it's going <laughs> to be fantastic, right? Um, but, you know, alas, uh, for the schools in your area and for the local economy and for the jobs of your constituents, right? This was a hard-hitting letter about the austerity you know, the austerity measures that scrapping private school would force onto our local schools. You know, there are going to be four or five more pupils in each class, right? We're pushing it up to 36, you know, 36 per class. I know that like, local state schools would absolutely struggle with like four or five well-educated middle-class children joining their comprehensive... <laughs> you know, like, that's just what comprehensive schools do not need right now. Um, 13.5 billion in GDP will be lost. Now this, like, I, I saw that and I freaked out. I was like, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, I went and looked at the actual Oxford study uh, that talks about this, and this is, this is like general value added. The 13.5 billion that will be lost is, is just the general fees, the money will be spent elsewhere on maybe more productive parts of the economy maybe. Um, it's not a net loss, but you can see the way that they're framing these things in a way to really scare the public. And what, what this letter, you know, I wasn't going to probably get involved in the campaign until I got this letter and I was like, fuck you, like how dare you send me this and try and scare, like, try and scare progressives into thinking that this is some kind of damaging and dangerous policy when we all know in our gut, we've known ever since we were kids, like how wrong and broken this system is. And what really hurt me about it was how proud they are of their record, how proud they are of their private schools. And that just made me feel sick. And it, it, it kind of, it was, it was very personal because you know, I'm one of, one of two councillors who was actually educated by a local authority school in the borough in which I represent, out of 60, right? Um, and, and here I've got, I've got ones of councils choose an independent school brochure, right? The local authority, which goes through the independent schools that it offers uh, children in Wandsworth to go to. The cabinet member for education has an introduction here in which he talks about some of the schools. Some of the schools aren't in London, um, but they're a quick train ride away for borders, so it's like, you know, it's nice and, nice and local. Um, and I just, it was really problematic, and it, and it brought up a lot of memories of school, because I went to a state primary school, and I remember it was, it was that kind of state primary school that you probably have in London, definitely in places like North London, um, where there's like lots of sort of like guardian readers and bougie types, as well as a, a, a range of, and mix of the local community. Um, and I remember when we were all moving to secondary school, I just remember the like clear and obvious distinctions that were being made, right? The middle class kids who were maybe like had like professional parents were going to selective schools. The rich white kids were going to private schools and Basically, all my BAME friends were going to state schools. Now, I'm, I'm, I've got a funny name. I'm Aydin Dikadem, right? I'm Turkish. I didn't see myself as, as, as really BAME until I was sort of like racialized as BAME based on the schooling that I was going to. And it became very obvious that like, there was something very clear that was going on here. Um, but also, there's another element. My, my mum teaches at a private school. Um, I was raised by my mum, a uh, single parent family, and she is an art historian, and art history is one of those subjects that state schools don't get access to. So in the 80s, she was sort of forced into the private sector, and she, you know, I don't want to speak on her behalf, but you, you know, her politics, she, she's too left-wing to join the Labour Party, she's just in momentum, you know what I mean? Like, um, uh, 
sh- sh- the, her school was at the top of the hill next to the state school that I went to. My state school was in special measures. And, you know, when the, when the private school had, like, a party or something like that, they, they bust in boys from the local private school that was, like, four miles away. And, they, you know, they were told not to speak to us on the bus. Um, there was, like, a, just, it was just, like, in, insane levels of segregation. Um, and I'm, I made it from that school, very much so, because I'm from the kind of family that has books in its house. I did well at my state school. It was a rough state school, and it, it was the kind of school that, that they will use as an example to say, like, this is why I want to send my kids to private school, right? But the education that I got there and the fact that why we need to make sure that this isn't just about economics, this isn't just about the 13.5 billion, but this is about integration, is because the things that I learned at that school are the reason why I'm here today, right? Like, it's incredibly socially and politically important that we have an integrated school system. Um, I made it to Oxford, right? I made it to Oxford. And at Oxford, just like Holly said, the buildings look like Parliament. You go from your privately educated Wellington school, you go into Oxford where all the buildings look like Parliament, then you go into Parliament. And the the talent and skill and drive and just like wit of the kids I was at at secondary school, like the, the people I was at Oxford, it paled in comparison, right? Paled in comparison. The amount of talent that was lost because of our segregated system, the amount of talent that, the, the, you know, I was writing to my friends who were in prison while these idiots, right, these idiots who have everything given to them were, had managed to get into Oxford, right? It just made me sick to my stomach. Um, Now, I want to go back to the ward level, right? Because I'm here to talk about local government. And in my own ward, uh, we've got uh, three state primaries and one uh, prep school. Um, And apparently, this prep school is quite good. It's quite good. One or two days a year, it lets the state school kids come in, which is, like, (laughs) pretty good, apparently, according to the charitable status of most schools. Um, So, like, you know, hats off to them once or twice a year. Now, the the kids from the local state school, they go in... uh, Sometimes when the children aren't there, when the Newton Prep kids, are, when the when the when the private school kids aren't there, and the children love it, they absolutely love it. They get to see a 3D printer. They have an entire art room that's dedicated to like just creative studies with like expensive paints. They get to play on the football astroturf. It's amazing for them. They have an amazing time that day. Um, but sometimes they go in, and I got this all from uh, a local teacher. Sometimes they they they're going in when the other kids are there. Um, and there's just this deep and visible like, awkwardness and tension. Um, the, like the body language, uh, the way that the, the uh, private school kids hold themselves, it's, it's, it's a very tense atmosphere and all the teachers feel uncomfortable and the children are like utterly depressed and they, and they hate it. Um, some of them get a lot out of it, but there's a, you know, it, it's so obvious to them, right? Like this is Wandsworth, like all the kids basically from the state school are BAME and all the kids from the private school are white. Right? That's, like, that's the most visible thing, and that's the thing I remember the most. Right? This is not the same outside of London, but in London, that is the thing that is most visibly obvious. Um, and we're, this is happening now. Right? We're having this now, where state school kids are allowed once or twice, if they're lucky, a year to get taken around this thing of, look what the other side has. Look what, you know, th- th- this is class society reproducing itself. Um, I'm an organizer in Westminster, and in Westminster, there's a patch of land called St. Vincent's um, Square, which is... Uh, owned by Westminster School. And the local state schools do their mile run around the green square. There's a big fence around it and they're not allowed in it. Once a year, they all have to book in an hour place to do their sports day in it. And these kids have walked past the square all their lives and they've never been able to get into it. I just, I just think it's disgusting. And <sighs> we can talk about the economics, we can talk about uh, the sort of rights of parents to choose. But for me, the fundamental thing is about integration, right? This will fundamentally transform British society because at the moment we do not have a comprehensive system and until we have a proper comprehensive system we will continue to see the reproduction of all the inequalities that have shaped like imperialism from the British state, have shaped all the most disgusting elements of the far right movements we're seeing now and have you know, obviously shaped the kind of far right government that we have. Um, <laughs> for some actions that you can do in your local authorities, right? In Somerset, in Jacob Rees-Mogg's local authority, the private schools in the district received just under a million quids in tax sort of rebates. You know, like 400,000 pounds of that would have gone on business rates for any normal business, right? Even under their own terms of like capitalist business rates, they're not even providing the things that they need to. Go back to your local authorities, work these figures out, get get clued up so that when they come on the economics, you can hit back because it's all nonsense. 
But the most important thing is, if, this, if we get this in the manifesto and, in, and, and, and we get this into government and we introduce this, this is the kind of thing that, it's not like the minimum wage where you can row back on it. It's not like the kind of policies that it takes a shift in the government and they just change the laws. This is like the NHS, right? They're taking 70 years to try and dismantle the NHS. You can't just, they're not going to fight to reintroduce private schools. They don't have the political capital to do it. They can't run people versus parliament if they're arguing those kind of terms. Once you set this boundary, once you establish this, once you make that claim, that is it, right? It's a line in the sand. And we have to be really, really tough about the historical moment in winning this victory. Um, because if we don't and we just tinker around the edges, it's not going to work. And they're going to throw everything we have Right, everything they have. They loved their private schools. They loved them. They loved their memories. They loved doing rugby. They loved all the weird stuff they got up to, right? Yeah? We have to smash that cultural nostalgia for it, and we have to win, right? Thanks, Ivan. Really powerful stuff. Um, let's, let's be uh, perfectly honest, this, this debate about reforming a two-tier education system in this country was uh, dead in the water last year um, because we've always been told that you can't change a system that has been serving the interests of the rich and powerful for more than 600 years. We've been told that this two-tier education system, this apartheid education system, um, is an integral part of the British social fabric. To, to call for reform has been equated to rocking the boat, or being unpatriotic, or worse still, communist. <laughs> the, the idea that uh, we need to change our two-tier education system just has never really taken off. When I was researching my book, uh, Posh Boys, I wanted to en engage in this argument. I, I approached uh, a number of private schools, um, two of whom were Eton and Winchester College, two of the oldest private schools in this country, neither of whom would um, pick up the phone to me to engage in the debate because I was being unpatriotic, rocking the boat, being a... Uh, uh, a naughty Trotsky um, <laughs> troubling their telephone system. So that they weren't involved. There were, there were, there were teachers who would, would get involved in the debate, more enlightened headmasters from private schools, but they, they weren't interested. And even after my book was published last year, the schools still didn't get it. I was contacted by one school. Remember, my, my book's called Posh Boys, how the English public school ruins Britain. <laughs> they contacted me to say, uh, how come you haven't name-checked our school? <laughs> I mean, it's right over their heads. It's not... But that was last year. And this is this year. And now we have newspaper columnists falling over themselves to call for the abolition of private schools. We have other newspaper columnists calling for the, the right of public schools to exist. Um, and better than that, we have politicians who are prepared to, um, prepared to run with the cause. Um, the debate has fundamentally changed. And I'd just like to, at this point, um, recognise Holly and, and la Labour against uh, private schools for you know, the unbelievable energy and enthusiasm they put into this. Because I'd, I think I'd still be sort of Don Quixote waving at mad windmills <laughs> if it hadn't been for the way Labour have got behind it. Um, because the truth is, what, what I thought, and I thought perhaps other people thought, is perhaps true. That it's now blindingly obvious if you're interested in meritocracy, if you're interested in social mobility, if you're interested in a big society, if you're interested in a fair chance in life, you can't have an education system where 
a narrow section of society is allowed to purchase advancement and privilege over the rest of society. And I think, you know, judging by the number of people here today, I think we've all suddenly woken up to this fact. Or perhaps we're all aware that other people think the same. We're not sort of tilting madly at, wind, at windmills. Um, and part, so part of the, the way that we want to introduce reform or try to get reform started was by setting up um, a, a campaign group, independent think tank called Private Policy um, sorry, private school policy reform. Um, and we're now up and running. We had an event in Manchester on Thursday where we were, um, well, we had the three private school heads, actually, at that event, and um, it didn't go well. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it did for us. <laughs> <laughs> did for us. Um, but at that event, we... we, we began to grapple with the, 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 the reforms and the obstacles to reforms and the way that we can take it forward. So I want to sort of set out the roadmap, if you like, um, and you know, a roadmap for genuine reform, not, as Haydn says, um, tinkering around the edges. So basically, we have, we, we have proposed um, several reforms, but they sort of they boil down to to four. One is opening the, the public schools, the private schools, up to um, disadvantaged children. The second one is taxing them. The third one is, um, what is the third one? <laughs> attacking, their attacking their charitable status, so reforming their charitable status. And the fourth one is nationalization. So, I mean, look, these reforms, some of these reforms have um, been tried and, and tested before. I mean, it was, it, Winston Churchill was the first um, person, really, first serious politician to talk about flooding our private schools with, with bursary boys. And then the assisted schools places system you know, was effectively tried to do that. But what we've learned from that experiment is, all you're really doing is you're subsidizing these schools with, with, with state money. You are, you are giving them a lifeline, an, an economic um, opportunity. Second, second reform is, is to um, try and tax them out of existence. So um, Labour have already got a, uh, a plan to impose VAT on school, school fees. Um, and we, we, would, we want to go further and um, abolish their charitable status so that you make them pay corporation tax. You know, and, this, and this would mean you, you bring in sort of two, two billion pounds into the, into the state education system. But to be truthful, you, you can, if you start taxing them, all you're doing, you're not, you'll never tax them out of existence because all that will happen is you will create very, very expensive schools that only very wealthy families can afford to send their children to. So, the third, third reform, what about making them be charities? Why not just make them do something useful for the community? Why not, you know, instead of letting them open their swimming pools up Monday night at nine o'clock, why not... Um, send some of their teachers around to the schools and um, do playground duty or you know let's 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 just let's make them let's make them do a little bit more charity let's make them let, make them comply with the public benefit that they're supposed to comply with well the charity commission tried that in 2008 and all that happened was the independent schools council instructed two very expensive qcs and they went to the high court and the Charity Commission's plans to impose proper charitable um, tests on these schools was thrown out. So, you know, we found that imposing, imposing a, or reforming the, the charitable nature of these schools isn't going to work, which leaves the third and perhaps the most popular proposition, nationalisation, 
or, um, I mean, phasing out private schools, um, abolition, call it what you like. This is the sort of nuclear, nuclear um, option, but perhaps, you know, the one that will actually produce a result. Because um, if you abolish them, then you start from ground zero, and you create a truly comprehensive system from the word go. In our, in our program, we want, to, we want to introduce a sort of five-year rolling, uh, rolling program of, of integration, really, rather than a, a ground zero um, proposition, so that you're causing the least disruption to children who've already begun their secondary education. And it will require primary legislation, there's no doubt about that, and the schools are obviously going to kick up, and they, are, they will present two, and already have presented two major impediments to abolition, integration, um, phasing out, call it what we will. First one is that it will be um, too expensive. It will, it will, it will, it will um, leave the taxpayer with um, an impossible financial burden. Well, that isn't true. We've looked into this, and let's start with the capital costs. So all the schools, all the, all the schools. Well, they already exist, obviously. I mean, Eton is a massive, massive estate. It's not a school, you know, it's a huge estate. You could get five comprehensives into Eton. We already, so we already have the estate, we already have the schools, and we're, we're suggesting that there's a wholesale transfer of all that property, all the schools, to the, to the state. So, you know, and in fact, we'll probably be better off. There'll be a surplus. There'll be a surplus of, of, of estate. We'll have more schools than we could deal with. We, and, we could, we, and we could use them for other things. You know, we could use them as, as, as special schools, as uh, um, sixth form colleges. I don't know. You name it. They have some fantastic buildings. The second, the second, um, the second um, financial dynamic to this is the running costs. So, don't we capitalize? Obviously, if you try and transfer 580,000, sorry, 560,000 children from one sector to the other, there is going to be a, a financial burden on the state. I don't think you can run away from that. And it's whether or not you're prepared to say, well, yeah, let's put an extra penny on the, on the income tax, maybe. But it's not as bad as the scam under private schools will make you think, because... What they haven't told you is they're extraordinarily wealthy anyway. They have endowments worth millions, perhaps even billions of pounds, which were created, some of them, you know, 600 years ago, purely for the benefit of the community, of the poor, poor, ch poor children living in the community. It was for their benefit. And these endowments worth millions, maybe billions, have been taken from the people and used to benefit and serve the interests of some of the rich and wealthiest members of our society. So what we're doing is reclaiming them and honouring the benefactors and med medieval philanthropists <laughs> who originally established them in the first place. So... <laughs> that's not an obstacle. We would, we would also ask the schools to carry out a financial audit because they're very cagey about exactly how much they do own and how much of that was originally you know, an ancient um, endowment for the benefit of the community and how much is part of their discrete investment funds. So we want the Charity Commission to carry out an audit of all the private schools, all the charitable private schools, and tell us how much we're going to get when we... <laughs> transfer them, because it may not cost as much as they have claimed it's going to cost. The, um, I'll finish on this, yeah, yes, yes. The second, the se the second, the second impediment, obstacle to, to cr creating a truly comprehensive system by taking these schools into state possession is the law. They say the law stands in the, the, the way of um, full abolition. Well, yes, there is a Human Rights Act. The European Convention of Human Rights gives everybody 
the right to an education. Every child has the right to an education. We're not, standing, we're not saying that's a problem. We're saying that this will give children even greater right to a better education under a fully integrated, comprehensive school system. So that isn't going to stand in our way. They also say that every parent has the right to teach their child the way that they choose to teach them. Well, I mean, that isn't true either because the state already regulates the way we teach children. The state's already involved. It's not an absolute right. You can't send your child to the local Nazi school. You can't send your child to the local Islamic state school. We already tell our parents where they have to send their children. And let's remember, when we're talking about rights, and when they you know, laughingly assert the rights of the rich and wealthy to educate their kids where they choose to educate them, we have to balance rights. We, we have to balance rights. And that means we have to also balance the rights of the rich and, and powerful against the rights of the four million children in this country who live in relative poverty, who will go to their graves never knowing there are charities like Eton or or Winchester or Harrow, whose sole purpose is to benefit the life chances of very entitled, rich and wealthy children. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can I start by paying tribute to Holly? Um, her passion, her energy, her determination that we're going to see this through. Um, but you know what's really powerful too is the fact when somebody's in the classroom doing the job, and Holly still is, despite doing all this work for um, Labour Against Private Schools and this campaign, um, she is in that classroom. And when she speaks about her students and her pupils, it's from the heart, because I know she's got that relationship with them. So it, I bet when you're speaking, you're thinking about them all the time, Holly, aren't you? So, so thank you for that. Um, as you know, I'm now a Member of Parliament, but when I sit on those green benches, I will always be a teacher. <laughs> always. It will never leave me. And everything I say and do that's to do with education, I'm on the Education Select Committee, it is from the heart and it is from experience. Um, 34 years as a, a teacher and head teacher. I want to start by talking about entrenched deprivation, first of all. Um, my last headship was in Dewsbury, in um, one of the poorest areas of the country. And I was a head teacher of a primary school with a phase one Shore Start Children's Centre. And to, to get a phase one children's centre, um, those of you who, who have been in the profession will know that it has to be the poorest 10% of the population. And I witnessed firsthand the impact of poverty on a child's ability, not just to achieve academically, but to even socialise. Um, I remember three and four year olds um, coming into school never having held a book, not knowing how to turn the pages, not able to use the basic vocabulary. I've experienced children who are going home at night to a home that has no heating, has no food in the fridge and no carpet on the floor. I've experienced children who don't want to let go of my hand at the end of a school day because we've made school warm, we've made school a place to feel safe, and they know they're going home somewhere that isn't. So I know what entrenched deprivation is all about and the impact on our children and their future. But then when we look at entrenched privilege, I go back to something you said, Aidan, about Westminster School, because Coincidentally, on my way to Parliament when I'm down in London from Yorkshire, I walk past their playing fields. I walk past their playing fields and they're either cutting the grass or, I think, polishing the leaves. They seem to have <laughs> enough people to do whatever to make it look wonderful. Now and again, I see some children 
sometimes with a teacher or a member of support staff, never more, it seems to me, than 12 in a class. And I look, think back to my days, because I've taught secondary as well, um, of you know, 35, 40 I had in a class one time. All of our children deserve to be taught in classes of 12. Every child in our country should be in classes of 12. As I'm walking past, um, on the opposite side of the road is a rehab centre. And when they have their breaks, a number of the patients come out and they stand next to the railings of these playing fields. And when they're having a break and a smoke, often with a member of staff, because many of them are really suffering and really vulnerable, I walk past them and I look at these playing fields and I look at these people that are suffering so much. Who knows what's brought them to this? And I think, this is just so symbolic of inequality in our society that couldn't those people who are suffering so much benefit so much from being in that one green space in that area to sit with their friends and to make themselves feel better while it sits empty most of the time? And I think to myself, this just isn't right. This just isn't right. And we have schools, private schools, across the country where we have these small class sizes and we have this entrenched privilege, as I call it. So, we've seen where the old boys network and the old Etonian boys network has got us. Currently, I'm prorogued. I quite like saying that. Sounds quite <laughs> I'm prorogued. Um, I was speaking with the climate change emergency kids yesterday in Huddersfield in St. George's Square with Harold Wilson there in the, in the middle of the statue of Harold Wilson, you know. And as I said, they can prorogue us in Parliament, but they can't prorogue us everywhere else around the country. And that's why I'm here. And I'm going to be all over conference talking about this. But it's not just about education, is it? It's about the social networks. It is about the old boys network. If we, you know, I can understand a parent with a special needs child. I'm on the Education Select Committee and our recent inquiry for SEND exposes the lack of provision um, for our most vulnerable children. So um, you, you know that, you know, it, I can understand, as I say, a parent thinking, I want the best for my child, my child's vulnerable. But if we made our mainstream education, our state education, so that every child, with whatever their needs might be, autism, dyslexia, whatever, whatever disability, had absolutely the right provision, which we will do as a Labour government. We will do that. We will make sure that there is funding, that there is support, so that parents won't need to, to pay for their child to get the correct support. But there is no excuse that there should be this inequality. And I think about this social networks, and I noticed this week that with the departure of John Humphreys um, from the Today programme, there's not one state-educated presenter on the programme. I think it was you, Robert, that put that on. I mean, it's just incredible, isn't it? So, none of us have a choice where we're born or to which family we're born into. None of us should not have the double negative there. That's not very good as an ex-English teacher. None of, none, of us, none of us should have, not have the life chances that every child should have that same opportunity to thrive and to flourish. And I have seen just those children, the, the babies into books pro, pro, babies into books project that we had. I've seen those babies that came that couldn't turn the pages and hadn't held a book. I've seen them leave school achieving and confident with the right teaching and the right resources. And the last Labour government, when we had Every Child Matters, that really was working. It really was working, but it wasn't enough. We've not been radical enough, in my opinion, with our education policy. We've not gone far enough. I know with our National Education Service, led by Angela Rayner and the front bench, we will deliver a radical agenda for education, a truly integrated, <laughs> inclusive occasion. And until we get equality in education, we won't truly 
have an equal society. It's as simple as that. I want a radical agenda to reform our education service. I want to press the reset button. I feel like we need to start all over again. We've got it wrong so far. So a phased approach will be needed where schools are brought back to our local communities and are fully state-funded and accountable once more to the public. A truly comprehensive future. So increased and adequate funding is essential. I think the public are ready for change. Just look at this room. It's full. We owe it to future generations to make that change. And if not now, when? Now is the time to break through the class ceiling. Thank you.